Hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Business of Property. I am your host, Cheryl Leong from Property Development Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. At the Business of Property, we interview superstar guests in the property development space that share their expertise, their deals and stories to help empower, build and grow our community of property developers and investors. So hello to Facebook land, LinkedIn, YouTube, whoever is here, shout out in the comments below if you like to say hello. And let's dive into today's uh, segment of the business of property. We have David Klingberg from Smart planning and design. David is a town planner, but he's been in um, landscape architecture and urban design for and been sort of in this space for over 30 years. And we're going to be talking about understanding urban character and learning the town planning tricks of the trade. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to invite David down to the business of property dance floor and have a little bit of cough in the meantime. <coughs> do you want a tissue? No, it's this side. No, I can't do it. There we go. <laughs> I'm glad you're presenting today, David, because I suspect I'm going to be in a bit of a coughing fit. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to the Business of Property again, David. Good to see Thank you. you. Thank you, Cheryl. I, I love being here. It's great. It's gr great to have you. So... <laughs> Tricks of the trade. I'm trying to get my catch my breath here. Tricks of the trade. What are we going to be talking about today, David? And without giving too much away, a little bit of a summary. We're going to be talking about um, a. I wrote down here a much a much misunderstood and necessary part of the planning schemes and development process. Probably much misunderstood, in as much as it's not understood at the time of when people are applying for development uh, there's in most planning jurisdictions if not all in Australia there's this there's this thing called urban character which if you don't respond to it or understand what council wants relating to urban character then um, you could be on the fast track to a refusal but if you understand a little bit about urban character then um, a way, you can there's a way, 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 there's a way through it. The process in in through around using it to facilitate and get your development approval so tell us a little bit what does urban character mean and are we going to be addressing that in your presentation or should oh, we yes. sort of address that right no, up? well why don't, be, why don't we jump I'll in I'll so... on what is urban character cheryl yeah all right let's <laughs> jump just let, let's jump straight in and i say you know, if I put myself on mute and have a bit of a coughing fit, you keep going, you keep going ahead. Shall I start the presentation? Please do. And I'll anyone that's joining us today, please pop in any comments, questions as well. I shall read them out in between when I see fit. But, um, yeah, please feel free to see, engage. Can you see this slideshow? Cheryl. Not yet. Oh, really? No. Hang on. Why is that? We tried this before, didn't we? It seemed to work. Mm -hmm. uh, hang on. Where's it gone? Oh. It has disappeared. It has disappeared. Hang on. I'm going to cancel that. This is what you call a um, something. <laughs> <laughs> Technical, technical difficulties. Technical glitch. That's it. I've now lost the presentation. Oh, my goodness. Oh, where is it gone? We can share it on our end. Hang well, on. we can keep talking while you're... you're keep talking. Hang you're, on. you're doing that. Okay. Urban on, character. Start again. Start again. Here yeah. we go. We found it. We found it. We found something. Now I need to find you. There we go. <laughs> and then I need to go share screen. And then you can go to slides. Uh, there we are. Can you see that? We can see that. Can you see that? 
perfect. We are ah. cooking with gas or yes. preferably electricity. <laughs> All right. So this this presentation is uh, is part of my ongoing series of turning planning nightmares into development dreams and. Um, I love talking about town planning and getting people development approvals because I think development is fab. And that's our little moniker for uh, fab development ecosystem. That's fab stands for feasibility approvals and building. And that's the journey that people go on um, when they are getting their development approvals or getting not just that, getting their development done. So feasibility approvals and building and if you if you do see yourself on that list in any of those uh, traffic lights, um, give, give us a call because we love connecting people in the development industry. Um, we have a four-step process to development success from a planning perspective. Um, we're clearly in the approval space as town planners, but we the first thing we do when we talk to our clients is get a planning appraisal. Uh, and concept, we do a, get a concept sketch done, get a planning appraisal done at council. We understand, we learn about the development journey through the council um, or what it should be like for our clients. We get a project team together um, and we manage them to pull everything together to prepare and lodge the application. And then after the application, we um, engage in our post application services. As a town planner, we're not just doing the town planning application and writing the reports, but we're also a bit like the ringmaster. We bring together the whole team for you to facilitate your development approval. Um, the designers, the architects, the landscape architects, urban designer, the more technical land surveyors, arborists, these days lots of controls to do with trees. And then they're all technical, be with the traffic engineer, the waste management consultant and the environmental consultant. Um, so the presentation, that, that's the team we pull together and manage your application for you. The presentation tonight is about neighbourhood character and the town planning system. And it really is very important to understand neighbourhood character. A lot of times, if council don't like your development, they'll use neighbourhood character um, to help refuse your development. They'll use um, character issues um, to... Uh, to facilitate the refusal of the application. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. So today's presentation or tonight's presentation will give you a little background, bit of background information. We'll describe what neighbourhood character is, uh, what it is. <clears throat> Why is it important for development? Um, what are neighbourhood character studies? Uh, how is neighbourhood character implemented in the planning schemes? And I'll give you some tricks of the trade about how to respond to naval character for a successful town planning application. So let's get into it. A little bit of background information. How does this naval character thing come up in your day-to-day -day planning journey? Um, just to explain a little bit about planning in general, and this is across the board, not just in Victoria, all across Australia, you have uh, this thing called strategic planning, and you also have a thing called statutory planning. Strategic planning, think of that as the vision making, the vision setting. Um, statutory planning is uh, the development approvals process that most of you uh, engage in when you're lodging a development application. Um, the planning process looks a little bit like this. You, even before uh, on the far left-hand side, you might have a pre-application meeting, then you prepare and submit your planning permit application. You lodge the application with council. It's uh, probably amended a little bit before they put it out on consultation, both internal and external consultation. External consultation being the public notification. Um, once they get comments back, you, they'll ask you probably more often than not to amend uh, some certain bits of it or get other reports done. And then council makes a decision on that application. Um, it looks fairly linear like this does here. In actual fact, it's a little bit more convoluted. Um, and these are actually slides out of uh, some of the practice notes for town planning in Victoria, at least. 
um, but it's a pretty similar process in all jurisdictions across Australia. A little bit of background, I'm going to, in Victoria and with most, if not all, planning schemes across Australia, the planning scheme is made up of multiple layers. Um, you'll, in again, in Victoria, you'll have um, things to notice, local planning policy frameworks, um, zones, so land use zones, but then sitting underneath the zones are things called overlays. Uh, um, and the overlays allow for variations to the controls higher up in the stack, all right? So allow for variations to the controls, for example, in the zones. And so where the, where the rubber hits the road with neighbourhood character is, to, is, is really where variations exist um, to the regular controls in the zones. But again, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Just to take away... Uh, the takeaway from this slide is that the planning schemes are generally quite layered and you need to be able to look uh, and find all of the different layers of the planning scheme that applies to your land. And this is why a town planner is so critical in your journey. Yes. Because unless you're studying these these planning documents and regulations on in and out, there's likely something, and they're, they're constantly changing as well. Yeah, so there are variations, uh, and we'll talk about those variations in a minute, but great, absolutely great point. So neighbourhood character, what is it? So a little bit of a little bit of homework, a little bit of reading. Neighbourhood character, and this is uh, from the Department of Planning, neighbourhood character is a, the combination of the public and private realms. Every property, public space or piece of infrastructure makes a contribution, whether great or small. Um, it, it is the cumulative impact of the, all these contributions that establishes neighbourhood character. The key to understanding character is being able to describe how the features of an area come together to give that area its own particular character. Breaking out character into discrete features and characteristics misses out on the relationship between these features and characteristics. Understanding how these relationships physically appear on the ground is usually the most important aspect in establishing the character of the area. Lovely definition, but not really all that useful when it comes to lodging and processing an application. This is because a better one. You can't quite it. say it's an objective, you know, it's not really objective. It's There's elements of subjectivity there, like what is... In that statement, absolutely. Yes. It's very subjective. But mm -hmm. when you're lodging an application, um, you need to be objective. And so there's mm -hmm. another way of viewing this neighbourhood character thing, which can be more objective. And it's like this from the Hobson's Bay City Council um, uh, spiel about neighbourhood character. What is neighbourhood character? Neighbourhood character refers to the look and feel of a place. It's the combination of qualities that makes an area unique. The features taken into account within the neighbourhood character study, so note that, include building heights, landscape and vegetation, building siting, front fencing, building height and form and materials and colours. So just note those things. These are some of the things that start to encapsulate in an empirical way what neighbourhood character, what neighbourhood character is. Now I've written quite a number of neighbourhood character studies for councils, including some I'll show you later. And those neighbourhood character studies, when uh, when written, uh, are written using some of these headings, if not all of them. Okay. So note the, name, note the number there of the neighbourhood character elements, what I'm calling elements, building height, landscaping, building siting, front fencing, building height and form and materials and colours. So we're starting to get a useful definition of neighbourhood character. Just to have a think, what is neighbourhood character? So remember it's about the way a place looks and feels not only from the street but uh, from what well, looks and feels from the street. Here's an example of some neighbourhood character. This is a real building. It's called the Pamela Anderson House on Beaconsfield Parade in St Kilda. So this is what you could call residential character, right? This is also residential character. So a, a tower block is residential character. So remember we talked about building height, um, colours and materials. This is also residential character. And so is this. This is residential character. 
This is university character. This is a, um, a, a building at RMIT in Melbourne. This is also university character. So the land use doesn't necessarily dictate character, but <coughs> there's elements of the built form, height, colours, materials, setback, etc., that start to dictate neighbourhood character. This is also residential character. And so is this. So you can see that building form changes, therefore character changes. So why is it important for development? Why is it important for you to understand as part of your development journey? Well, it's actually put into planning schemes, this term, naval character. Again, in Victoria, in clauses 54 or 55 of the planning scheme, which is known as res code, there is a neighbourhood character standard. So you need to satisfy the neighbourhood character standard. So a residential developer must meet the objectives and should meet the standards of the residential de development provisions in clause 54 or 55 of the planning scheme. The first objective is in these clauses that must be met is the neighbourhood character objective. So it's actually right at the top. It's right at the top of the assessment criteria, this thing called neighbourhood character. The standard for this objective requires the design response to be appropriate to the neighbourhood and site description, respect the existing neighbourhood character, or respond to a preferred neighbourhood character. All right, we'll note that, a preferred neighbourhood character, and respond to the features of the site and surroundings. Okay, so it's a thing you actually have to respond to. Remember I showed you different types of residential neighbourhood character. So it's saying that you need to be able to respond to that neighbourhood character as it exists in your area. Well, how do you go about doing that? You do it with a design response. So this is an actual thing you have to do as part of your development application. All applications must be accompanied, accompanied by a design response. The design response must explain how the proposed design derives form and responds to the features described in the neighbourhood and site description. The design response should therefore include an evaluation of how these identified features or characteristics of the neighbourhood influence the design and how it responded to the neighbourhood character features identified in any local policy or neighbourhood character overlay. Remember I said there were overlays. Now in different planning jurisdictions, an overlay may be called some other thing, but it's still a part of the planning scheme and you need to be able to find that. So if there's there's... As part of your development application, you have to understand the existing local character and respond to it appropriately. So the design response can generally be presented as a plan with notations that show how the proposed design clearly relates to any other dwelling on the site and to the surrounding development and neighbourhood. It may also be include a written statement. The design response must include correctly proportioned street elevations or photograph showing the development in the context of, an, of adjacent buildings. Now, this is something you need to do as part of your application. And so when you are hiring your designer, when you're hiring your town planner, you need to make sure they can actually do this thing, right? The neighbourhood character assessment and design response. What does that look like? Well, from the City of Greenwich Long website, a neighbourhood and site description is required to be submitted as part of any planning permit. So it's a thing you need to do or you need to get your consultants to do for you. Um, for single dwellings on lots of less than 300 square metres, multiple dwellings or subdivisions. So pretty much anything you want to do, you need to do this thing. And an example that they show in the, on the website um, is this. So this is their example of a neighbourhood uh, character assessment and design response, simply one page plan, which numbers existing conditions and identifies through the, through the numbering system um, how they've responded to those existing conditions through the design. Probably not the best example they could have shown, but this is the example the City of Greenwich Long use. Main point is you've got to do one of these. If you're doing development, this has to be done. Your consultants need to do this. And if you're doing something that is maybe a little bit different to the existing character of the locality, you, this needs to be done very well because it's part of the assessment as per the plan scheme. So 
what are neighbourhood character studies? So we've established the need for understanding and responding to neighbourhood character. But then there's this other thing, these other things out there called neighbourhood character studies. Now, remember, I mentioned before that in, as part of your assessment, as part of the assessment, you need to respect the existing neighbourhood character, so that's what's there now, or contribute to preferred neighbourhood character. Now, how do you know what's preferred? So when you go out on the street, what you're looking at might not be what's preferred by the council. It might actually be something different, okay? So neighbourhood character studies are a, the way that councils have used to establish what's preferred in the area, okay? So for the City of Hobson's Bay Council um, material, the new neighbourhood character study identifies the existing and preferred character for the municipality. Furthermore, it identifies what council wants to achieve in the area under design objectives and sets out how this can be achieved with design responses. New residential development needs to consider how it fits in with the preferred neighbourhood character for the area. Not just the neighbourhood character, but the preferred neighbourhood character. And it's these character studies that identify what is preferred. So the neighbourhood, for the City of Hobson's Bay again, why are we having a neighbourhood character study? Council's neighbourhood character study has an important role in the application of the new residential zones. This is written way back 20 years ago when they implemented new residential zones in Victoria. In particular, the design objectives and design responses identified in the neighbourhood character study set out the planning controls or the schedules that new residential development needs to comply with. Now, this is hinting that it's something slightly different to the standard controls because it's saying that the design objectives and responses identified in this particular study are set out in the controls or the schedules. So the schedules are the variations that they have found by or that are necessary because they've undertaken the Naval Character Study. So as it says here, the schedules, so these are the schedules are schedules to the existing zones. Read that as variations to the existing zones. The schedules allow variations to the following design considerations contained in the planning schemes, residential zone provisions and res code provisions at clause 54 and 55 for dwellings and clause 56 for subdivision. What this is saying is there are standard controls that already protect um, scale or define and protect, define pre propose, preferred development scale and define um, um, off-site and on-site amenity impacts uh, and define what type of development is appropriate in those zones. And this is saying that through the use of the character studies, they can vary those existing controls um, to these elements. So they can vary these elements, heights, setbacks, provisions of private open space, provision of landscaping, front fence height, site layout and subdivision. So this is saying that a, an initial primary reading of the zones may not be enough for you to understand what council actually wants. Because through the character studies, they have defined a, a preferred character, and that preferred character is, that, is then quantified as variations to the zones using these elements. So variations to height, setback, private open space, provision of landscaping, front fence height, site layout, subdivision. So that's why you do need to understand how to read your planning schemes. This means council can protect the existing character of different parts of the municipality and guide new character in growth where in areas where growth will be allowed. In my view, I believe this is like council having two bites of the cherry, right? They've already got existing controls in place, which are in the standard controls across the state for the various zones. And then they're layering on top of that um, variations through undertaking these neighbourhood character studies. 
So what do these character studies look like? You need to be able to read, firstly find, then read the character studies, understand what it is they've found and what the preferred character is so that you can then respond to that preferred character. So and, David, is, is that to do with sort of when you've got areas that are sort of prime for gentrification, when you've got that balance of, you know, so the old world heritage style of property where you do want to keep a certain type of, of character but then understanding that there's there's newer, more modern contemporary type building. Is that is that what, what the purpose of this the study is and, talk, and when you talk about a preferred sure. character style, is that is that what we're alluding to? Yeah. So so, and you'll see here. So this 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 is a it's a great question. Thank you. Um, here's a here's the so I this is the city of Murundara uh, neighbourhood character study, and this is one of the sheets out of the precincts uh, out of the precincts that were identified, and you'll see the numbers there. So what <clears throat> what, a, what a character study does is it looks at a whole council area and then it defines areas of uniform character. And that is uniform height, build form, materials, setbacks, landscaping, etc. And then it quantifies what's, what those areas are like. It identifies what those areas are like. And then what if, if deemed appropriate, that the planning controls reflect or protect what that area is like now at this point in time. Or, or if it's an area that so that so protecting it, it says this area is like this, therefore, and we think that's of value, uh, or it has some value. The, the the residents have said they like that character. And so then they they uh, essentially build the retention of that character into the planning scheme, okay? So let's say, and this is area 42, precinct area 42, it says this area is like this, we want to keep it like this, and therefore there's some guidelines that are put into the planning scheme to ensure that that area remains the same forever and a day. So let's say, for instance, that area has a certain setback of 10 metres. You and, and the standard setback in res code would say that uh, the minimum setback uh, is 9 metres. This would say in this particular area, precinct 42, the minimum setback has to always be 10 metres. Or it might have a control to do with landscaping and the like. That's locking in character um, that is preferred and they want to keep it exactly like that. There are other areas where the character isn't valued as much and they will allow for more change. So you might allow, say the street setback might be um, five, uh, might be again a standard 10 metres, but nobody, in the, nobody really cares that it remains that way and they might allow for uh, a setback of up to five metres, for example. Does so that answer the question? Yeah, 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 it yeah. does. And and there's a there's a follow-on question here <laughs> from um from the floor. Does every council explain what their preferred neighborhood character is for each part of that council? No. So some councils won't have done this work. Mm. Yeah. So I'll just so this this is the front page of a character statement. Uh, you'll find typically it'll describe key characteristics, the preferred character. So you should be looking for, a, it says a preferred character statement, talks about some threats and issues, and then it goes into talking about the design guidelines. So it will then identify, and this is a typical format, it'll identify above and beyond that, that list of items that I showed you before, which I'll go back to, above and beyond this list of height setback private open space, landscaping, front fence, height, side lay, and subdivision. They'll then go on to say, if you want to do development in this area, where there's a character where, where there's a character study and it's been essentially um, translated into the planning scheme, there's some other things you need to take into account. Mm -hmm. Lot frontage, vegetation, siting of buildings, building height and, and form, building materials and design details, 
front boundary treatment car parking structures. So all of a sudden, there's all these extra things that you need to address in your planning response or your design, your design in your response. And it actually talks there, talk about it, it breaks it down to the character element, the objective <clears throat> uh, around that element, the des appropriate design response, what to avoid, and then they'll give you an illustration about what's right and what's wrong. So this is all extra stuff that you need to consider when you're doing your development or preparing your plans. And this needs to be understood in order for you to not only get the, to not only uh, to design it, but also respond to this in your planning application and then be able to justify your development against this criteria. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's, there's terms in there, etc. So this is some work we did ages ago. And don't just think that it's in Victoria. This is this, These things are all over the place. These are one from Queensland as well. And you'll see the same, you'll see the same um, uh, assessment criteria and, and considerations in where these things exist across the board uh, around Australia. And you'll see there the character elements there. So this is for Cairns and the Cairns Naval Character Study. You'll typically see in these um, documents, you'll see the uh, the area that's of the of that's being defined as uh, uh, an area of similar character. You'll have a character statement. You'll probably give it. A, they'll probably give it a name of some sort, and then they'll have the the character elements and how you're meant to be responding to them. And if it's any good, I'll also give you illustrations of what's appropriate and what's not. So in naval character studies, you'll have your description, key characteristics, preferred character statement, and then your design guidelines. And again, that list of design guidelines is, is longer than the standard uh, uh, guidelines or, or assessment criteria that are in your standard clauses in the scheme. And there'll be a map. So important to know about the maps because the maps define the locations where that preferred character needs to be adhered to. And those lines are very important because on one side of the line, you might have your standard residential controls. And on another, the other side of the line uh, will be the variations to those controls. And so here's another example. Sometimes in the naming of the areas, you'll get a feel for what they're trying to achieve as well. So you'll see there, um, you'll see actually some really good examples. So you'll uh, you just look on the left-hand side, informal bush suburban area. So that's, gonna, yeah. that's telling you that there's probably a lot of bushland in the area, so therefore they're going to want to protect trees. Classic garden suburban area. So that'll be an area full of um, formal gardens in your in your front in the front yards, right? Uh, substantial change area A will be an area that will probably allow for extra height than what is in the street already, and probably less setback than what's in the street already. So the naming of the precincts. Uh, all the areas, uh, it sometimes gives away the sort of development and the extent of development you could do. So if I was looking at that map and I was thinking about where I would uh, invest in a property, it would I would go straight to the substantial change areas because that's where you're okay. going to get most of your uplift. So how is neighbor character implemented in the planning schemes? Well, um, this is a pretty short section of the presentation. They're, they're found all over the place, and that's why you need a plan to help you find them. Um, typically, they're found uh, as additions to, or yeah, as I call them additions to, or variations to the existing zones, and or variations to the existing existing overlays can, that can already exist. Right, so they're variations to the scheme. Right. And they may be found, so, and, and just one other thing, I mentioned before the strategic planning and statutory planning right at the beginning of the talk. Strategic planning is the vision setting. So a character study is really like a bit of strategic planning because it's really identifying at a high level 
where these areas are and what they're like. Then those findings get what they call translated into the planning schemes to make them law, right? So once it gets translated into the scheme, it becomes statutory planning. Because once it's trans or development approval planning, once it's in the scheme, once those elements that have been identified as special get translated into the scheme, that's when it becomes law and that's when you've got to be able to assess it or understand it and assess it and design to it. So you'll see reference to character in all sorts of documents like city centre plans, obviously neighbourhood character studies and precinct profiles, but other frameworks like in like uh, the Fisherman's Bend Development Framework will also mention urban character and will translate controls into the planning scheme to achieve the character that they want to achieve. At the end of the day, with any development, I would always be asking, is there an urban character study or mm. are there urban character statements that exists for this area that either uh, have been translated into the planning scheme so that I can then understand that, understand those and design um, to them? Or remember this, is there an urban character study that forms or, or in any other strategic document, is there mention of urban character that I need to understand in order to respond to the context of my area and lodge my application. You should yeah. always be asking that. Because mm -hmm. in Victoria, and I know this exists in other jurisdictions, if, if that study started to be done and it's gone through, for example, a public notice period, mm. planners might be thinking that it's, that it's, even though it hasn't been translated into the planning scheme and therefore become law, they might already in their heads be thinking, well, this thing's being done as a piece of strategic work. We need mm. to consider it when we're doing our assessment of applications. Mm. Mm. Okay. So just um, ask. Which is a good segue into this question. Do you, do you recommend and is fitting in with what councils say are their limits or trying to push the envelope and putting forward your reasons for doing so. So yeah, good this question. is a tricky question. <laughs> uh, do I recommend pushing the limits? Depends how deep my pockets are and what the return on investment is. <laughs> um, I, 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 look, you always get, a, you always get a, an easier planning, have an easier planning approval pathway if you if you comply with the rules, right? Mm. It's sort of that simple. You've got to ask the question, is it worth the time, mm. money and effort to argue the point? Mm. Um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, the, and council, by the way, it does work the other way sometimes. Council might be seriously entertaining a change in character that allows for mm. more development, right? So a, a great example of that might be a strategic plan around an activity centre where council all of a sudden, and I've written these before, all of a sudden want to see more development in an area, right? So the urban character statement actually becomes one of growth or more development or mixed use development as, as opposed to standard residential development, right? So okay. it does, I mean, I've been painting a sort of negative picture, but it can be, if you know where to look, changes in urban character or preferred changes in preferred character can be absolutely fantastic. Mm. You know, you can be sitting on a gold mine. Something changes and, and, from farming zone to resi zone or from mm. standard general residential to mixed use and has an accompanying increase in height. That's brilliant. And which again goes back to the merit behind doing a pre-lodgement meeting with council as well to be able to say, to get a sense of their um, receptiveness to your proposal. Absolutely. I would mm -hmm. I would nine nine and a half times out of ten recommend that. But other what's the other what's the what's the half time you <laughs> Oh you might have a you might have a council that you know is pretty opposed to anything. 
at any yeah. time, in which yeah. case there's no point having that meeting um, because they're just going to say no. Uh, yeah. Or we've certainly had this recently where, um, how do I say this nicely, you sort of can't trust what they're going to say. Um, yeah. <laughs> unless you got methodologies in place to ensure that what they're telling you is the thing that they they're going to stick to um yeah. uh, and and that may be for a whole heap of reasons it might be due to politics the, the planners themselves might not know exactly how the council laws with certain applications are going to land um so you know my point is you know you're going to have a fight anyway so you might as well lodge it straight away yeah yeah Okay, well, we're coming coming now to the, the juicy juicy bit. What what are the <laughs> tricks of what are the tricks of the trade? And like you what said, you, we've, we've 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 gotten through all the technical side of things and the regulations and all of that. We're going. Oh my goodness, how are we going to get around this? Oh yes, great question. All right, next slide. So, firstly, do your own site analysis. You've got to do it anyway, and respond to it. Now, this is a real development site. Um, I mean, the, the, the photos don't do it justice. But on the left-hand side, you've got a you know, relatively small but significant in terms of character, um, apartment development, transitioning to single-storey detached, two single-storey detached dwellings uh, that form the development site, and then another existing development, the cream-rendered cream um, building on the right-hand side. That's the existing context. Um, so you'll see that that's the two lots in the middle are actually an area of transition as it relates to that being a development site, right? So when we first got presented this, the development proposal, um, so the, yeah, the development proposal was actually quite uniform as to how it responded to that context, um, uniform across from left to right, right to left, um, and therefore one could argue it didn't respond to what would have been a prima facie look at the site, which showed that it was actually a, a cup, it was actually some land between two quite distinctly different built form typologies. So uh, what we did, and that was, that was the proposal, again, quite uniform. What we said was actually acknowledge the fact that there was a transition from one scale of development to the next, uh, one type of window form to the next, one type of materiality to the next. And actually, we, res we so we said, okay, in order to respond to the existing context, let's do a building that appears to transition from one scale of development to the next, one typology of materials to the next. And even, mm -hmm. even you'll see from right, uh, left to right, uh, different types of window form. On the left hand side the window form that was more appropriate to the apartment or contextual as it relates to the apartment development on the right hand side window forms that were more like the cream brick development on the right hand side and uh, and that that simple advice and that simple response to the context uh, got them a development approval mm. the next thing to do um, which i think is really important if there is an existing character study, sometimes the character studies have stuff in them that aren't actually translated into the planning schemes, right? So my, the point I'm making here is, that, and, a, and, a, and I said before that the character study is more like a strategic planning piece of work. Once it gets translated into planning schemes, that's when it becomes law, right? But if you can go back to the original documents, the original planning st uh, character studies, you'll see words in there that start to help you understand and to help you brief your architects. So in this case, the City of Mooney Valley um, Central Residential 1 Precinct, the preferred character statement, so go back and read the preferred character statement if it's not in the planning scheme. If it's in the planning scheme, that's great. Um, and it'll start to give you some clues. It talks about low garden settings, um, finishes articulation of form, recesses, windows, and setbacks or porches to complement the pattern of traditional period dwellings. So that's saying, look at the traditional yeah. period 
dwellings. You don't have to copy them, but you whatever you're doing has to complement them. Okay. Buildings less than three stories will comprise pitched roofs with prominent eaves. So if you want to get an approval, use pitched roofs with prominent eaves. Um, use of and use lighter uh, lighter finishes. Um, there we go. And have modest front setbacks and have consistently low or permeable front fences. And in your design response, once you've designed like that, you can point out that you've done all these things and it is in line with the preferred character statement and you will have an easier pathway through council. Uh, same again, uh, this is for precinct 67 of the Burundara uh, character study. Um, uh, various styles of houses, post from 94, 45 till now, so that opens up a whole range of development responses. Two-storey dwellings, side-by-side uh, -side townhouses, pitched roofs, uh, 10 to 20 metre wide in front setbacks, uh, rear gar large rear gardens. Um, so there's an example whereby if you are trying to do infield development, council could say, oh, well, the character study, character statement says we need large rear gardens. Right. Mm. Um, predominantly detached with... Uh, uh, Side with side setbacks of one to three meters, uh, so that's telling you do not apply for something that goes from boundary to boundary. They're just not going to like it, right? And medium to large front or rear gardens. So read the character statements. And then uh, I think lastly, follow the guidance. So a lot of these character studies actually have little vignettes or little drawings that yeah. clearly show what they're after. It'll have a tick and a cross, um, you know, or it will literally say avoid three-storey facades, which means have the upper level um, set back, avoid symmetrical design. Um, it'll give guidance about locating car parking structures, uh, maintaining double-storey scale, um, and use pitched roofs. Don't have flat roofs. Um, and I mentioned previously the reading the maps. This is a real map that's meant to be used to understand where the precincts are. Not really that useful. So if you can't read the map properly and you, it looks like you're on the boundary of a character area, again, ask. Don't be afraid to ask the planners where the line is. Now, we've certainly had that case where what it appeared, where the line appeared to be wasn't where it actually was on the ground, if that makes sense. But um, yeah, if you can't read the maps, because again, they're really important. One side of a line could could be the difference between having an extra two stories or not, uh, going from boundary to boundary or not, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So really important to be able to read the maps. So um, And be able to see them with a huge magnifying glass as well. <laughs> That's right. Because they're often about this big. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, so that's it. That's neighborhood character, how to respond to it, tip, tricks of the trade. Fantastic. Um, and remember, development is fab. And we, <laughs> we love talking to anybody in the development industry. So get in contact and we'll connect you with others. Yeah. Thanks. So, David, number. tell us a little bit about what you do in, in that in that regard. So you're, um, you've got a little bit of a collective there. So just in a quick summary about what, what you do in that, that space. Oh, we, uh, so every day I reach out to people in the development industry and I ask them who they want to be connected to. And so we value our clients and collaborators. So we like to um, connect with all of the different players in the development industry so that when clients come to us, we can not only help them with their approvals, but, you know, we can yeah. even recommend great builders or great planning lawyers or um great uh um, all right plumbers even you know um yeah. because we genuinely believe a rising tide lifts all ships so yeah, you know we, we, we love this we love development we love helping people make lots of money through their development and create great lifestyles and in order to do that you got to connect all the right people so that's, Absolutely. That's and, and this is, you know, the, the reason why we've got the business of property and we have, you know, as I said, superstars like you who, who come 
and you know spare your time and share the knowledge so that the community can benefit from that um and it's about building your team and and david you know david's in planning however you need your team of engineers architects and all of that as well which you know what david's talking about in terms of collaborators as well so um we'll go back where's your con where are your contact details um oh. david david there we are don't run away um and where which sort of area do you operate in if people want to get some planning advice oh we um we, we so we're based in victoria but we do development in we help with development in new south wales so mainly victoria new south wales metro melbourne regional victoria will do any development applications i've been in the industry for 30 plus years i work for with most councils i've been the urban design advisor to quite a number of victorian councils and some councils in new south wales so um we love working in both of those jurisdictions mainly, but we are doing some stuff in Tasmania as well. Right. So smartplanninganddesign.com. Dot com. Oh four three eight four five nine five five nine. Oh four three eight four five nine five five nine. And email David K, K at smartplanninganddesign.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. Um, a lot of information. Oh, there, there's the number. Oh, there we go. It's like that. <laughs> David, you talk about the Wizard of Oz. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Well, thank you for joining us and, and again, presenting on another value, very, very, very valuable topic in terms of planning. Um, I know that we come across it often. Not many of us really understand what it means and the impact on our, our planning applications. So that's really, really good that you've covered that off in a lot of depth there. So appreciate you being here, David. I'm sure we'll have you on board for another very valuable topic uh, further down in the business of property. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today that you've come on board, uh, watching the live. And if you're watching the replay, comment hashtag replay below make sure you visit and subscribe to our youtube channel obviously we have one the business of property and we can find the replay of this episode but also our past episodes and if you found it valuable in today's show make sure you hit the like button you know the big thumbs up thing and get notified when a new episode comes up so until next time keep well stay safe be good and we'll see you all again in the business of property take care thanks david cheers bye-bye Thank you. Thank you Well done.